Hey, welcome to the uh, virtual version of the Buckland Museum of Witchcraft in Cleveland, Ohio. Obviously, we can't have our doors open right now, so I thought I'd take the opportunity to talk to some of my friends that are kind of involved in, uh, well, you know, the kind of stuff that we deal with here at the Buckland Museum. My name is Stephen Intermill. I operate the museum in partnership with my wife, Jillian. Uh, and we do this also in partnership with our friend, Tony, the actual owner of the artifacts. So uh, these are strange days. We're gonna talk to some friends. And the first one we're gonna talk with is David Metcalf, our Psy, research, rich, Psy researcher that I've known for years and years. I can't recommend his Twitter enough to keep track of what's happening in psychic, paranormal, ufology, et cetera research. The bio on his Instagram claims that he explores the outer edges of society and mind, which I feel is pretty apt. So there's going to be a lot of loud noises going on. We're on a pretty busy street with a lot of motorcyclists buzzing through, which is pretty entertaining. So uh, greetings, David. Um, so let's see here. David, welcome hey. to the Buffalo Museum. Thanks. It's great to, to visit virtually. So I have... I have a lot of questions for you. Most of all, like, where did you first encounter strange stuff? Were you finding like books at like scholastic book sales as a kid? Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, those uh, some of the folklore stuff at the school library definitely caught right. my eye. Um, I think it really kicked in with that Mysteries of the Unknown series. My parents bought that for me when I was a kid. Um, oh yeah, so that gave an intro into all the weirdness you got like Aleister Crowley and all the rest of it a bunch of stuff now, with psychic programs if you ever see the witches one which is kind of rare I'm pretty convinced that the uh drawing on the cover is supposed to be uh the first Wiccan high priestess in America um Rosemary Buckland if when you look at it you're like oh yeah that's it is, so, that yeah. in, is that in the Mysteries of the Unknown series? Was that the one? That's the one that has like a lot of uh, kind of like the African. They had a, some of the like the the more. I don't know. It's a, it's actually a fairly decent book on the subject of global witchcraft. If I'm remembering the same one, um, I kind of feel like most of those books were actually really well put together. Yeah, which, it was a good. Yeah, it was a good series. There was a. Uh, you know, it was interesting because those came out while the Psy programs were still classified. And um, so they were doing, you know, it had, there was a legitimacy to the research because you had Krippner, uh, Stanley Krippner, um, who's a, a well-known psychologist that uh, did a lot of kind of fieldwork studies on shamanism and that. And he was working with some of the, the government Psy program kind of on the sidelines. And so there was a lot of uh, backing at the time for, you know, getting a little bit deeper into the legitimacy of these areas. And so that that particular one, since it was put out by Time, um, actually sort of acted as a public face for what was at the time still semi-classified. So. So that's something that I know that you're really interested in right now. You know, like the Psy research. What do you think's going on? What do you think's going on in the Pentagon right now? <laughs> I don't think that they, there's not much funding uh, right now actually mm -hmm. coming from the government on anything like that. But one of the interesting things um, is that there's a lot of tech funding for it. So um, Silicon Valley's actually got some interest. Uh, Julia Mossbridge, who works with the, uh, has worked in the past, I think she's a little bit with Institute uh, for Nordic Science. Um, she actually wrote an article recently about the Silicon Valley funding for this stuff. Um, but, you know, with AI development, that's consciousness studies and that go into that. Um, so what is mind? How does mind work? Um, that kind of thing. And that always bridges into some of the weirder areas. But also, I mean, stuff like uh, the... PK research, so psychokinesis, the ability to affect matter with your mind. Um, that, you know, they've got a lot of evidence that shows that the human mind, or at least intention, can uh, affect random number generators. So there's some, you know, applications there that folks are looking at for, you know, what can we do with this? 
Um, but yeah, the money, the money right now is not in government. It's more in, in the private industry and that. Well, I guess that really makes sense. It's a uh, private industry is actually what's going to be taking us to space more and more. Directly. Yeah, yeah, so. exactly. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I mean, that's Elon yeah. Musk has his, uh, yeah. Um, Musk has his uh, mind computer interfacing stuff that he's doing. Um, so, you know, there's, they're looking into that too. And, you know, there's, there's kind of the, uh, it's interesting cause it's almost like a parallel stream. Um, you know, what he's doing is actually just plugging into the brain and then being able to use a direct interface between the brain to a computer system or, you know, some sort of technological system to control it. Um, but on the sidelines of that are, is the, the PK research, you know, the Rhine Center, uh, which was the Duke Parapsychology Lab, um, where J.B. Rhine was working with Duke back in the 30s to do telepathy tests and that. Um, the Rhine Center is now its own independent uh, group, but they recently, um, John Kruth, who's their executive director, recently did some uh, how emotions affect computers. So they set up a kind of a computer network that was be able to be closed off into a, into its own sort of thing without any other effects, you know, not plugged into the internet or anything. And they set up an experiment to see how people's emotive, uh, you know, output affected the computer systems. And they got some pretty good results on that one, so. All right. So I'm just playing around, just learning the software here. So I know that you love that stuff, but I know that there's something that's a little more dear and uh, near and dear to my heart. And that would be things like so, uh, folk saints, like quantum words. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So pretty much what brings us here is COVID-19. And I'm just really curious what's going on with, uh, you know, my favorite of all the folk saints right now, quantum words. <laughs> you... Are definitely the person to ask. You definitely have your ear to the ground on this kind of stuff. So very curious. Have you heard anything interesting? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, uh, one of the interesting things I think there's a there's a devotee in the Philippines. So um, you know, Santa Muerta is um, most people know her through the Latin American and the Mexican tradition. Um, but it yeah, has, you know, I apologize. I should probably ask you to uh, kind of give us a uh, overview of who she is. And sure. Yeah, Santa Muerta. It's just Spanish, fancy Spanish for uh, Saint Death. Um, you know, uh, the tradition that most people are aware of now, if they are aware of it, uh, kind of became popularized in two thousand one when uh, Dona Keta. Um, who is uh, in Chile, vendor in Tokyo, uh, which is a uh, kind of rough neighbor in Mexico City. Um, she brought out her altar into the street, and <coughs> it became a kind of uh, first salvo in the, the face of what kind of private tradition up to that point. Um, it's, uh, as you said, folk, he's a folk saint. Um, then you just, essentially, I mean, Santa Muerta is death. So she's the, you know, the, the patroness of death. Um, one of the names she is uh, Santissima Muerta, which is the most holy death. And so, um, you know, she's kind of entered into devotees' lives in the sense of, um, you know, working with death to have a better life. Um, there's also a criminal component to it in the fact that she's the patroness of kind of the margins and uh, the dispossessed um, and, you know, areas of violence and that. So uh, there's a, there is a kind of narco cult element to it that, that does exist and is very real. Um, but I think a lot of people in the U.S., uh, especially in uh, neo-pagan circles and pagan circles, encounter a kind of massive version of it. Um, you know, and as to your question of what's going on with her right now, um, it's an interesting time because, you know, obviously uh, with her with her kind of role over death, and uh, you know, one of the 
one of the things that she's known for is being a, a miracle worker and a healer. So, um, you know, a lot of the devotees are very much, uh, you know, working with her right now to try to, to stem the, the sickness that's around that's, that's been going through the virus. Um, but it's kind of weird because, you know, the, uh, most of, you know, in lighter times, um, bringing out a skeleton saint in public uh can get some you know some bad kickback and right now i think a lot of devotees are concerned with the fact that uh you know they could be even more ostracized right now for that there was a a fellow in uh the philippines um which interesting enough the philippines has its own kind of holy death tradition um which he's been able to bridge with the the mexican tradition um they uh he was talking about how he wanted to bring out his his altar um uh, as a kind of act of healing for the community but he knew that the the local community would not be happy with seeing uh, a grim reapress appear in the streets in a time when you know the virus is rampant so um andrew chestnut who's the kind of the leading english language scholar on santa muerte just posted a photo on twitter today of a uh, nurse who's a devotee and she's openly wearing her, uh, you know, her necklace with the San Muerta icon to uh, kind of pass along the healing abilities of the saint. So it's, it's an interesting time for the, the tradition. So yeah, uh, Andrew Chestnut, uh, who is another person that I follow on his Twitter because I find it just completely fascinating, his whole uh, take on it. Um, do you know what its handle is? Because I think our viewers would be interested oh, yeah. in. Uh, I want to say it's Andrew Chestnut one. Let me check. Yeah. And it's chestnut, not chestnut. So let me see what his, what his name right. is. Yeah, he's, uh, he's the chair of Catholic studies at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. And he wrote the book uh, Devoted to Death, Santa Muerta, a Skeleton Saint, um, which was put out by Oxford University Press back in 2012. And it's the first and uh, kind of the leading English language resource for learning about Saint Death. Let's see what his name is. Uh, yeah, his, uh, his Twitter handle is just Andrew Chestnut One. Um, and he's He's always posting about Santa Muerta. So if yeah, you I, have really I really encourage people to follow him and David. It, it's really a fascinating worldview. So along with Santa Muerta, you have another. I lost it. Oh, did I disappear for a second there? You did, yeah. Um, so you and I also share an interest in things like botanicas, uh, folk magic, uh, hoodoo, conjure, etc. Yeah. And have you seen any kind of response to uh, the uh, coronavirus with that? I showed you something recently. Let's see if I can. Yeah, I kind of going in the background there. A local shop to Cleveland. Um, the uh, goddess elite are now selling, you can see them in the background here, uh, coronavirus, let's see here. There's any way I could shrink this up. Eh, I'm still learning this. Um, anyway, so it's Corona bottles, you know, the beer, and uh, with virus painted on them. And it's some kind of like uh, yeah. <laughs> a, magic. Yeah, magic protection magic against magic. it. It's well, that was one of them. There was the votive candles, which I'm sure most folks are familiar with the saints' candles. And then you've got the ones like, uh, you got stuff like this, right? Like the, you know, yeah, prayer against There's evil. Kind of candle. Yeah, which I this I picked up in Athens, which was awesome. I found a, a grocery shop in Athens that actually sold sold that very excited about that but um 
yeah there was one uh, that, uh there's a shop in mexico city that or at least in mexico i don't know if it was in mexico city proper but um around mexico city that was selling uh you know, against the coronavirus things. And it was amazing. I'm, Andrew and I were talking about how incredible it was that they got it produced so fast. Because, you know, the ones you just showed were Corona bottles uh, kind of hacked to make, a, to make a candle. But these actually had the, you know, the full, uh, the full, uh, what do, I don't know, whatever the graphics on it and everything to uh, be a, a prayer against coronavirus. And they were cheap too, they were a buck 40. Um, I forget how many pesos that is, but they were uh, fairly cheap. I think that, you know, in, in any time like this, you've got, you know, folks trying to sort of, you know, assuage their their fears and their, their stuff with magic. Um, it's just so weird because um, this stuff always floats on the margins. You know, it's hard in the best of times to kind of find, um, you know, information on it unless you're totally plugged in. And, uh, you know, in a time like this, I think a lot of people kind of go to the ground, um, you know, and the media gets filled up with, with a little bit more just sort of repetition of the mainstream news stuff or weird conspiracy theories and that. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are definitely like you, you know, you, you showed it there and that was the, the candles you showed that shop was, uh, about to close up too, right? That they had posted that as kind of a stop by in the next couple of days and get yours before we shut the doors. Yeah, I think most of the local shops are doing, um, you know, you give them a call and maybe they'll bring it out to your car, uh, drive by kind of thing, which um, do what you can. I know uh, Goddess Sweet does that. Pretty sure Spirit Apotheosis is doing that these days. So uh, no longer can you come and browse, hey, you know, and... I mean, I guess it depends on who you are, because I see this stuff is essentially essential, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, a, totally. Practice. So. Well, it was interesting. I posted the, you know, I posted a photo on Facebook of that, uh, the prayer against uh, coronavirus, and uh, a lot of the spy researchers were really pissed off by it. The guy <laughs> got a pretty negative reaction from them. Uh, it, folks who were for, who were more into folk magic and that they were they were totally down with it. Uh, you know, but the, the Psy researchers were actually fairly upset by it. Um, I know that I had a couple people that, that commented on, uh, how it was, it, they were ashamed of their own culture. Uh, you know, folks who were from Mexico were, were kind of ashamed for it, you know, and it's interesting to me cause I live in rural Georgia and, you know, this stuff is, it's like, it's every day here, you know, I mean, not so much suburban transplants that have come into rural Georgia, but the place where I'm at, you know, folks have, their families have been here for, you know, a hundred years plus. And, uh, you know, they don't use the same kind of pop culture terms in that, but the idea of magic, uh, you know, magical practice is fairly just the way it is. You know, I mean, the the guy who fixed our well was telling me about a, a local dowser um, who actually, when the when the dowser had passed away, it's this guy Hoyt Duncan. Um, he passed away at 108, and funny enough, he'd lived through the uh, the Spanish flu, you know, back in 1918. So, uh, you know, he had stories of as a you know a traditional healer um, in kind of the, the rural tradition, you know, he was born into it and he could, uh, he was known for healing thrush, which is a child childhood condition that babies and kids get where they get like a, a kind of fungus in their mouth and throat. Um, and he was known for healing thrush in that and, uh, being able to stop blood, uh, stop bleeding, you know, your kind of common Southern U S uh, folk magic stuff. Um, you know, but Hoyt was a, a good, a good Baptist, <laughs> you know? So, uh, it's just, it, it's interesting to me when I see people react like that towards, you know, something like the, the prayer against coronavirus candle, um, you know, when it's, it, I don't know, it, it's not even weird to me, you know, it's just, that's just like the, that candle I just showed, you know, I picked that up at a, a gas station grocery, uh, on my way home from the university, you know, so this stuff isn't really down here at least, you know, and I'm sure in Cle I mean, if you go, when I lived in Chicago, you know, the, it wasn't far to a Botanica. 
So, you know, or in Atlanta and that. So it's just, it's funny to me, the different, uh, the ways these things are so commonplace even today, you know, and, uh, and yet so hidden. So I have to ask your opinion. So I have a fashion accessory that I like to wear and I was wearing it earlier. Yeah. yeah. On a, on a <laughs> Jacket. What, what did you paint with yourself? Right? Do I need to or I keep washing my hands? <laughs> Do what now? What did you? Is this going to offer me any protection, or should I just keep washing my hands? And I, uh, you know, you always got to double up. Let's get get the double protection. I would wash your hands. Wash your hands again. Wash it. Maybe you know, you might want to bless it with some disinfectant. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, that's very true. I just, um, although I know it's really not doing anything to protect me from like the viruses, it's, uh, I feel more confident when I leave the house with it on. So I'm going to keep wearing it. Yeah, I would rock it. You know, the, you know, it's interesting. Uh, a friend of Mitch Horowitz's, um, Harvey Bishop, who writes a lot about thought and kind of the, um, the uh, the ways that new thought has transferred into the contemporary world. He actually put out a question to new thought ministers on whether or not, um, you know, at this moment in time, kind of calling off services was a betrayal of their faith. And some of them, you know, some of them said yes, and were fairly adamant about the fact that you know there was there was no such thing as illness. And people still should show up and do all that, you know. Um, some of the more uh, tempered one, <laughs> tempered ones were, you know, you, you can, you know, do both. Just why don't you just stay home and still do the new thought thing and go online and do it online and use this as an opportunity to kind of grow, you know. And uh, I, I, it's hard because I think that, you know. Um, there's definitely different levels of practice, uh, but I think that the majority of people aren't at the level of practice in any tradition where they'd be able to kind of mitigate a virus. You know, um, there's, you know, the practitioners that can go through extreme situations and, uh, you know, have, have the ability to have an effect in the world that's fairly uh, extreme, you know? But that's like 0.0001% of, of the, the reality, you know, of the reality of people who are practicing this stuff. So I would say always, always do both, get the <laughs> use science and, and all the rest of it, you know. So I'm going to take that to heart. So I do have a kind of a follow up question right now. It's uh. What are you doing? What are you doing to keep yourself sane right now, David? Immersed in your research? I know that you're still doing your nine to five. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I work for the university, so we're working remote. Um, thankfully, I live in rural Georgia, so I am I am isolated on some number of acres of woods and whatnot. Um, and uh, I don't know if I am staying sane. I don't know if I ever, I don't know if that's, uh, <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know. I'm just kind of going through, uh, uh, yeah, drawing and stuff like that. I don't know. I've, it's been weird. The transition, honestly, for the from the university work to coming home and that has pretty much caught my, my mind. And uh, we started planting a garden. So I've been gardening. <laughs> yeah. uh, a victory garden, right? So yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, you mentioned your art, and I have to say that I am so proud to. Uh, so, dear watchers, viewers, I uh, I had started painting a few years ago, and I had inspired David to uh, start his painting as well. And I see his work, and I'm like, oh man, he laughed at me pretty quick. But <laughs> um, so I we were recently talking about doing a show here at the museum of his work, and we're gonna follow up on that. I was hoping at some point in 2020, uh, now things are probably gonna get pushed back to 2021, but uh, very excited for that. Our next show, we have the arts. We just, uh, it was going to launch a few days ago, is uh, Maja Daoust. Oh, fantastic, um, yeah. 
Maja. Oh yeah, I know. Yeah, I know Maja. Uh, awesome. Yeah, Ma yeah. Maja's so awesome. some of your illustrations, the uh, the ones on like the black paper and the yeah, those are incredible. Absolutely yeah. incredible. Yeah. So really, uh, uh, as soon as we open, that's going to be on the walls. So that's and, that's that's a well, that's a great you know that's a great thing for folks to look forward to. That's I mean, her stuff's amazing, and she's such a cool cool person too. Yeah, super, we super uh, we had lunch with her in LA a couple of weeks ago, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was like she uh, en enveloped us with cosmic guiding light for hours. <laughs> yeah, really. she's intense. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I got to hang out with her, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Ferdinando Bushima, who's a, he's a performance magician that uh, performs at the Magic Castle. Um, oh, so really? I got to go and hang out with him and see his see his uh, performance. And then we had lunch with Maja. She's a mutual friend. So it was very cool. Yeah, oh, cool. So um, any recommended reading right now or watching, listening? Uh, what I don't, yeah, I, you know, I'm right now I'm really obsessed with Whitley Strieber. So I don't know, all my, my recommending reading is going to be Strieber oriented. I just think he's, he's incredibly fascinating. And I don't think that, you know, I think his, the way he got put into the media with communion and that sort of took away from the sort of breadth of his, of his work. But I'm just, I'm fascinated with him as a, as a person and uh, as a writer. Um, and I've I also been reading a lot of UFO stuff. Oh, did you? Did you have a chance to meet him? Yeah, I worked at uh, I worked at Walden Books in the early '90s, and my uh, my section that I had to take care of was the paranormal and the occult section. Okay. And uh, it was uh, it was cool. He came in for like an in store. Yeah, for and, uh, signing. What did he have? Was it one of his one of his post communion like breakthrough or transformations? Yeah. Or something like that? Um. Honestly, I don't remember. It had an alien on the cover. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was. <laughs> it was <laughs> maybe it was Secret School. Oh man, they're all so good. I don't know. He's just he's fascinating because it's not you know. Um, he's just it's it's a, a totally different take on the on the whole UFO thing. You know, and with having co-written a, a paper with Diana Pasolka, who wrote that book, American Cosmic, and that um, it really gave me a different kind of perspective on the whole UFO thing as more uh, a little bit more witchy and weird and and strange than, you know, just uh, Martians flying down in in rocket ships and stuff. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, the UFO phenomenon is it's got more more to do with witchcraft than uh, people from Mars, I think. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, the early contactees, you know, were, uh, they were all uh, the first, the first sighting before Kenneth, so Kenneth Arnold, 1947, was the the flying saucer sighting, right? Like the one that framed the, the whole, these are, they're called flying saucers and all of that. That was Kenneth Arnold, 1947, but 1946, uh, Mead Lane and Mark Probert um, through the Borderland Science Research Associates. Um, they actually put out a thing. There was a San Diego sighting and uh, it was channel that, well, there was actually physical sightings of these ships, um, which uh, may have been the same time period when Marjorie Cameron was, was reported having seen uh, UFO stuff. Um, but yeah, Mead Lane and Mark Probert were doing channeling work and most of the early contactee stuff and a lot of the early, uh, even within the flying saucer kind of popular milieu, most of it was tied to uh, neo-theosophy and channeling and occultism and that. Uh, the men in black tradition, you know, the, the mythos of the men in black that comes out of, um, I forget the guy's name, but uh, the book was published by Gray Barker and the guy who uh, I think it was the three men or something like that. But that, uh, that guy was, you know, at the time was practicing, uh, you know, some sort of pop sort of witchcraft sort of stuff in the room um, and thought that he had channeled these entities. So there's a lot of stuff there. That's a lot more interesting than, you know, the discovery channel. Um, 
you yeah, so actually, I had an experience just w- last week with an individual where I thought to myself, if that wasn't a man in black, I don't, I don't know <laughs> what the hell that was. <laughs> um, it's, uh, yeah, it's these are really strange times that we're living in right now. So you had mentioned Marjorie Cameron, mm-hmm. and uh, I, uh, I keep thinking about. Marjorie these days. I, I don't know what I was in LA a couple weeks ago and it, it's like you could still feel that like dark force presence playing <laughs> over everything. And yeah, LA's a LA's a different spot, you know. It definitely has a feeling to it. Yeah, we went to the uh of uh, yeah, I should, probably shouldn't get into that stuff. Um cool. So David, thank you so much for coming in and hanging out with me here. Yeah, it, you thank know, you for inviting me. I hope uh, I hope we can do it a little while later and kind of. Uh, I I think there's going to be more some more uh, Santa Morte uh, things popping up in the next few weeks, and it'll be kind of fun to do a refresher. Yeah, we'll refresh on it. That'd be good. What more research comes along, and uh, yeah, if you want to. St- I'm going to say goodbye, but if you want to stick around for a second, there's something I want to sure. tell you about here. Excellent. So, and uh, all right. So, dear viewers and listeners, um, thank you so much for hanging around with me here. Uh, people are always asking me, Stephen, what can I do to help with the museum right now? Right now, we're very solid, but um, uh, as soon as this closes down, I'm going to go pick up my old t shirt order that's been sitting on. Uh, sitting at my printer's place for probably about a week now. So I know that it's not contaminated. I'm going to have those up on the t- on the uh, website here probably this evening. Um, other than that, just positive thoughts. Um, and, uh, oh, I have some things coming up tomorrow. I'm supposed to speak with a gentleman named Gary Parsons out of the UK. He lives in London, and he sent me a list of the 13 films that you need to be watching right now in quarantine. And then on Monday, we are going to do a live stream with Elias. Uh, Many of our visitors here get to know Elias because he gives them tarot readings. And um, we're going to uh, kind of take an adventure with the fool, uh, go through the uh, major arcana, and he's going to kind of uh, talk about that. And then I have some other things lined up, but uh, I think this is going to last a long time, so no reason to rush everything out. Um, Would Jerry Springer always say? Be kind to each other. (laughs) I don't know. I got this colic that drives me nuts. Take care.